Hi there. Welcome to Sex, Love, and Murder. This is your host, Aphrodite Jones, along with my co-host, Mike Ferguson. So police officers and detectives are supposed to protect and serve the community. And we know they receive highly specialized training to be able to do their jobs. So we know some of this training includes knowing what to look for at a crime scene and then analyzing the clues to try to figure out who committed that crime. But what happens when a police officer uses that kind of training to commit the perfect murder? Now, this is a story about a police woman, an officer by the name of Stephanie Lazarus, who used her training to eliminate the woman who she considered to be her romantic rival. It was on the morning of Monday, February 24th, 1986, that John Rutten left the Van Nuys condo that he shared with his newlywed bride, Sherry Rasmussen, and he made a 20 minute drive to his workplace. The couple was just married for three months. And that morning, Sherry told John she wasn't feeling well. She might be skipping work that day. She might be staying home. John would later tell investigators that he tried to call Sherry several times that day, both at home and at her workplace, but he was unable to reach her. One thing that John noted that was odd was the fact that when he tried to call home, their answering machine did not pick up. But John didn't make too much of the fact that he couldn't reach Sherry because she was often very busy and hard to get in touch with. What John couldn't possibly know at the time was that he would walk into an unimaginable scene when he got home that night. John Rutten returned to his condo around 6 p.m. after a long workday and noticed the garage door to their unit was open and that the 1985 BMW, which he had bought for Sherry as an engagement gift, was gone. He also saw shattered glass all over the driveway. So at this point, John's first thought is that Sherry must have hit something with the BMW, which shattered one of the windows. And as John goes up the stairs in his garage, he sees that the door leading into their living room is ajar. What a creepy feeling that is. Oh, F, that's not a good thing, never a good thing, to think that somebody may have gotten in your house. And then when you're actually entering the apartment, you don't know what you're about to face. In this case, what John comes upon is his wife's lifeless body in front of the fireplace. And Sherry's face was almost unrecognizable, swollen, bruised, and covered in dried blood. John touched her skin and it was cold. He checked Sherry for a pulse, but couldn't find one. And in total panic and disbelief, John calls 911. When the police arrived, the body of 29-year-old Sherry Rasmussen was already so stiff that her arms and legs were slightly raised off the ground. It's horrifying. It's hard to picture. It really is. Sherry was wearing a red bathrobe and a camisole, so clearly she had not gotten dressed that morning, which, to police was an indication that Sherry had been surprised by unexpected visitors. Well, you know, remember, she said she wasn't feeling well, so it's hard to pinpoint why she was still in her nightgown. Yeah, if if I'm not feeling well and I don't go to work, chances are I'm just walking around in shorts and a T-shirt. I'm not putting on a three-piece suit. Exactly. So homicide detective Lyle Mayer was on scene, and he examined Sherry's face, And he could see that her right eye was closed and swollen. It looked like she had been hit with either a punch or a blunt object. Yeah, now to Detective Mayer, everything about the scene told him it was likely a burglary gone wrong. And why do I say this? Because a drawer had been pulled open from a coffee table and its contents were strewn all over the floor. There was a shattered vase on the floor that investigators believed to be the object that might have caused the damage to Sherry's eye. But Mayer noticed that the stereo speaker had been knocked over and it was lying next to Sherry. And the wires had been pulled out of the speaker, so it appeared as if someone had attempted to unplug some of the other stereo equipment in the room. A VCR and a CD player were found stacked on the staircase as though someone had plans to steal them, but they never did. Now, on top of the CD player was a small amount of blood. Upstairs, there was a sliding glass door, and it was found shattered, and it's going to turn out 
that this was the glass that John found when he first arrived home. There were three bullet wounds found in Sherry's chest in what police described as a very tight group. But only two of the bullets would be recovered from Sherry's body, the third having completely exited her back. Detectives found a blanket in the living room that had a bullet hole in it, and they could see powder burns around the hole. When they examined the bullet wounds to Sherry's chest, they quickly determined that two of the three were contact wounds. This means that for two of the shots fired, the killer had placed the muzzle of the gun right against Sherry's chest before pulling the trigger. And that blanket had been used to quiet the sound of the gunshots. And I think, Af, that's probably an explanation for why the neighbors would say that they didn't hear the gunshots. Right. Because in this case, no one heard or saw anything. There were no witnesses to this crime. But there was a very important clue that would be found on Sherry's body. And this clue is in the form of a bite mark on the inner side of her left forearm. Police took saliva samples of the bite and they made a dental cast in the hopes that they could use it to match the bite mark of a future suspect. But remember, back then in 1986, DNA testing didn't exist. The only thing they had back then was blood typing. So that swab of saliva would actually sit in the freezer of the L.A. County coroner's office for years, waiting for forensic science to catch up with it. Meanwhile, detectives would interview John and have him retrace the events of that day. John tells detectives what he had done, and he has a solid alibi, but at the same time, he offers little help to detectives as to who he thought may have wanted to hurt his wife. Police asked John for the names of their friends and close acquaintances so that they could be interviewed, but John could only think of people like Sherry's sister and brother-in-law who had just recently visited. I mean, there was a nurse who Sherry lived with before she and John met, but there was really nobody that he could think of that would want to harm or kill his wife. The detectives, including Mayer, already had a theory about what happened to Sherry Rasmussen that day. Their theory was that she surprised two burglars and that they had killed her. So it was a robbery gone wrong. That's basically what their theory was. Yeah, and Af, I think they're basing a lot of that on the fact that because they were surprised and they killed Sherry, that forced them to leave the scene in such a hurry that they didn't take any of the items that they had planned to steal, besides her car. Right, they did take the BMW, which actually was one of the things that gave that theory a big boost. Because 10 days after the murder, Sherry's BMW was found a few miles from the couple's home. And detectives then learned that a few weeks after Sherry's murder, there was a similar burglary in the same area with the same MO. The burglars entered that second home with the same type of gun, a 38 caliber. They pointed it at the would-be victim. She survived and was able to identify these two men as Latino men who had been seen at that robbery. And now sketches were created and police were putting up wanted posters for these prime suspects in the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. But there's something that clouds this theory, in my opinion, because there's only two things that were taken that day from Sherry's possession, and that was her BMW and the couple's wedding certificate. Now, what kind of burglar is going to steal a marriage certificate? I mean. And how would police not have placed some type of importance on this missing item? Maybe they didn't know about it, but it's just weird. Well, an importance that leads to them thinking that this has to be somebody that knows Sherry or the couple. Because who else would want to do that? Well, it's just a strange item to have gone missing. And, I mean, it's like the last thing any burglar would take. I mean, what value does that have? Yeah, I mean, only a person you would think that has a major issue with this marriage would take something like that. And it's going to come out later that police failed to interview a number of suspects that you would have expected them to talk to back then. The first was a guy named Alan Tarski, 
and he was a neighbor to John and Sherry back in 1986. Alan Tarski spoke to John not long after John discovered Sherry's body. But Tarski would say that although he lived only 20 feet away from where the murder occurred, he was never contacted by police at any point in time. Yeah, it's like they had their theory and they were sticking to it because police also did not interview Sherry's sister, Teresa, either. And Teresa was actually one of the few people who had visited with Sherry shortly before her death. As a matter of fact, she saw Sherry the day before she died. Teresa never could figure out why the police didn't come to talk to her and ask her whether she knew anyone that might have wanted to harm Sherry. Sherry's parents, Nels and Loretta Rasmussen, they weren't buying the story of a robbery gone bad because Nels had his own theory on who the suspect was from the very start, but he didn't know the woman's name. He only knew that she was an L.A. cop that was an ex-girlfriend of his son-in-law. And Nels had some very good reasons for believing that this woman may have been involved because Sherry had told her dad that John's ex-girlfriend actually showed up at her work about a month prior and confronted her, telling Sherry that she and John were still lovers. But Nell's initial discussions about this possible suspect were dismissed. Police thought that he had watched too many crime dramas, he was playing amateur detective with no skills, and no real information to work with. Turns out, Detective Mayer did make a note of the ex-girlfriend that Nels mentioned, and it was in the case file. But apparently, he never followed up on it. And F, it's hard to believe that it would be 23 years before Nels' suspicions would be proven correct. 23 years. Just let that sink in for a minute, Ferg. Imagine... You are sitting wondering what happened to your wife, your loved one, your daughter for 23 years. You know she was murdered. You think you may know who did it and nothing's happening. Yeah, I think much tougher than having no idea who did it. Nels had a, he knew or he thought he knew who did it. And that's important because we have to point out that Detective Lyle Mayer, who in my opinion has egg on his face, in this matter, has refuted all of Nell's claims over the years and steadfastly has denied that anyone ever mentioned to him the name of Stephanie Lazarus. Now, Mayer also denied that Nell's Rasmussen ever approached the LAPD to report his suspicions about his son-in-law's former girlfriend. So the question here is whether someone is lying or is this a case of selective memory? Because at some point, Mayor does admit that the name of Stephanie Lazarus did come up in the investigation. Well, he does, but he says that her name came up several months after the murder and Stephanie Lazarus was never questioned because they didn't feel that it was warranted. And you got to wonder back then, did police hesitate to go after one of their own? Was she just considered to be above the law because Stephanie Lazarus was with the LAPD? I mean, why wasn't she questioned back then? I think you're on the right track there. There had to have been less of a rush to go question an LAPD officer. Who didn't seem connected in any way to this crime. Let's face it. Yeah, you're right. So let's go back to the beginning of this story, to 1978 on the campus of UCLA. It's there that the students Stephanie Lazarus and John Rutten meet while living in the same dorm. And by the way, I was a student there at UCLA at the time. So I have to say that was really an idyllic campus and a perfect place to fall in love. Really, F? Tell me more. Well, Tell me more. I mean, love is easy when you're young. What can I say? I'm not giving away any. I don't kiss and tell. Sorry for. Oh, the audience wants stories. Maybe down the road. But maybe this wasn't the kind of love relationship that most people think of. Now, you have to talk about John Rutten. This this guy was tall. He was good looking, athletic. Stephanie Lazarus was cute, but not what you would consider a striking beauty. The two played tennis together. They were friends and actually good friends, but their relationship would never turn into the kind of romantic love that Stephanie was looking for. There were stories that Stephanie was madly in love, but John would later claim that while they were in college, 
they fooled around a little bit, but they never actually had sex. I find an odd thing to claim. I mean, and I was there at this point. This wasn't the olden days. I mean, it was before AIDS. This was when sex was free and easy. Why would he say they fooled around, but they didn't have sex? It almost doesn't make sense. I mean, it does seem strange to me, Af, that if they were being intimate in college, John doesn't want to admit that, but he's very free with admitting that they have sex after college. I, I don't I don't get the distinction there. I think they were friends with benefits and he didn't want people to think that she was his girlfriend. Now, exactly when they started having sex, that's not really that important because the fact is they did have sex and they had a lot of it for many years. And I guess the sex was good because John kept going back for more. So John graduated in 1981. He got his degree in mechanical engineering. And then Stephanie Lazarus graduated one year later in 82 and entered the Los Angeles Police Department Academy not long after that. Rutten and Lazarus continued their sexual relationship after college, but John was dating other women while he was maintaining this relationship with Stephanie. And this relationship with her, it would last for four years, ultimately ending in 1985. And the problem with this relationship is that Stephanie Lazarus didn't see it on the same terms as John Rutten did. She viewed it as much more than just a casual fling. She didn't see them as F buddies, if you will. And, and this difference in their perspectives would have disastrous consequences down the road. In 1984, John Rutten met Sherry Rasmussen and Sherry was tall, she was striking, she had a pretty face, a gorgeous smile. Sherry Rasmussen was the kind of woman who left an impression on men. And not only that, she was extremely intelligent. And her family would later say that Sherry had wanted to help people from a very early age. So this is a woman with a good heart. She enters Loma Linda University at just age 16 years old, ready to become a nurse. And by the time she met John in her late 20s, she had already advanced to be the director of nursing at the Glendale Adventist Medical Center. And John and Sherry hit it off immediately and they fell hard. And the pair would get engaged in 1985, less than a year after they met. So it was a whirlwind romance and it was on the heels of him breaking up with Stephanie. By this time, Stephanie Lazarus was a patrol officer with the LAPD. And apparently she did still hold a torch for John because she didn't take the news of him finding another woman very well at all. After learning about his engagement to Sherry, Lazarus actually phoned John and asked him to come to her condo. Now, during this meeting, she professes her love to John and pleads with him to leave Sherry so they can be together. And although John had no plans to leave Sherry for anyone, he and Stephanie did have sex that night. John will later testify that was the only time he had sex with Stephanie before Sherry's death. But we can't be so sure about that because there are other allegations. And this is where he plays a role in this thing because he's encouraging Stephanie without realizing it. And old habits die hard. So remember, she was his um, sex buddy for many, many years. And maybe he felt he could continue that before he actually walked down the aisle. Yeah, Af, I hate to, to paint my gender in a bad light, but there's no doubt that some men see sex just as sex. And I think that's what's going on here with this guy. Yes, and clearly a woman like Stephanie wanted to see sex as lovemaking. So it's no big surprise that Stephanie thought John still loved her. And prior to Sherry's marriage to John, in November of 1985, Stephanie shows up at the Glendale Adventist Hospital where Sherry worked and tells Sherry that she's been John's girlfriend and in fact, that they're still seeing each other, that they're still sleeping together from time to time. What a bombshell that is. Yeah, that couldn't have made Sherry happy. And we know it didn't because Sherry would tell her dad, Nels, about this encounter with Stephanie at her place of work. Because you have to add that into it, like you said, Af, not only is she upset about what Stephanie Lazarus is telling her, she has to hear it at work 
probably in front of co-workers, that just makes it worse. Nels would go and tell police all about this incident involving John's ex-girlfriend, but he never knew the girl's name. He suspected John's ex-girlfriend, the one who showed up at Sherry's office. And by the way, she showed up dressed to the nines and she instigates this whole confrontation telling Sherry that if she couldn't have John, then no one could have him. Oh, Af, that sounds like a major threat to me if I've ever heard one. Well, I mean, she's psycho. Let's face it. I know there's people who think like that, but who actually comes out and says it? And why is she all dolled up? What's that about? Well, I think Lazarus is trying to intimidate Sherry, you know, by dressing up. And during that visit, she allegedly told Sherry another thing, which was, if this marriage doesn't work out, I want you to know that I'll be waiting to pick up the pieces. You know, I can't imagine how somebody comes out and says that. How do you go to a woman who's about to be married and tell her, if your marriage fails, I'm going to pick up the pieces. I'll be here. Like, is she so sure that their marriage is just not going to do well? Or is she trying, what is she trying to accomplish there? Well, for one thing, you've said it before, Af, it's ballsy. You got to mm-hmm. say that. But as far as what she's trying to accomplish, is she trying to break up the marriage by telling Sherry these things that are going to upset her. Yeah, she's trying to break up the engagement, perhaps. Remember, they're not married yet. Right, keep the marriage from happening. So Sherry's friends would later come out and say that she actually told them about other harassing behavior that Lazarus exhibited. Sherry was telling her friends that John's ex-girlfriend started to show up wherever she went. And one of Sherry's friends was quoted as saying that Sherry couldn't go to the store or to the gym without having this woman show up. So she was clearly fearful and she just couldn't get this person, this woman, out of her life. And Sherry continued to confide in her father, Nels. And she would tell him that just before her marriage to John, she started to notice that she was being followed. She told her father that this person following her was dressed like a boy and had these crazy eyes. And this stalking continued even after the marriage, but because the stalker looked like a male, Sherry could never be sure about who it really was. And Ferg, more than 20 years would go by before the police began looking at Stephanie Lazarus as a suspect in the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. And by this time, Lazarus had risen through the ranks of the LAPD to become a detective in the art theft group. She was a well-respected and highly decorated police officer. And she had a squeaky clean reputation. It was said that she did everything by the book. And if you look at some of the positions that she held in the department, they were some of the most coveted jobs that you could have homicide and internal affairs art theft now lazarus would eventually marry a fellow police officer and the couple adopted a baby girl so at this point in time life is good for lazarus oh my god she's at the she's at the top of the heap at the lapd and here she is being the mommy being the wife being the do-gooder and all of a sudden in 2008 It was Rasmussen, not Lazarus, who was rising from the dead because her cold case was reopened by the LAPD. And investigators in Van Nuys began to rework the case from the beginning. And they used the evidence that was collected from the crime scene to find something totally different about the set of events that Detective Mayer was theorizing about back in 1986. They didn't believe that Sherry Rasmussen had surprised a couple of would-be robbers. What they thought, based on the evidence they had, was that Sherry was the one who'd been surprised and she had been ambushed by her killer. And these investigators poured through the case file. And one of the things that they noticed was the name Stephanie Lazarus with the initials P.O. next to it. Which means police officer. Curious if Stephanie Lazarus might still be an officer on the force, 
Detectives typed her name into the LAPD directory and they got a hit. So now the cold case investigators realize that they're going to have to go after one of their own. And they make a pact that they're not going to hesitate to do that, but they want to keep their work stealth because news and word travels fast. And they didn't want Lazarus to ever get wind of their murder investigation. Most crucial in their findings from the cold case file was that saliva sample and the dental cast taken from the bite mark that had been left on Sherry's arm. And DNA technology had advanced by leaps and bounds by 2008. The saliva swab that was taken from the bite mark back in 1986 contained DNA evidence that indicated it had been left by an unidentified female. And that finding, Ferg, was critical because up until then, police had been looking for male suspects. So when the Van Nuys detectives found the piece of the puzzle that had been there all along, the fact that this was a female who was the assailant, and then they discover the entry in the file written by Detective Mayer back in 1987 that reads, John Rutten called, verified Stephanie Lazarus, police officer, was former girlfriend. I mean, talk about a bombshell. Talk about a hit. This is the lottery for them. A cold case investigator called Nels Rasmussen with the news that they may have cracked the case. And and you have to imagine, Af, Sherry's father was so elated that the murder of his daughter may finally be solved. Yeah, he flies back to L.A. from Arizona to tell investigators, this new group of investigators, exactly what he told the original detectives back in 1986, which is that he believed the ex-girlfriend of his former son-in-law, who was an LAPD cop, had murdered his daughter. Nels may not have known her name, but investigators were sure that he was talking about Stephanie Lazarus. Yes, and what they did is started to dig into the records of Stephanie Lazarus from the day of the murder because they theorized that if a police officer was going to kill someone, that they would do it on a day that they were not at work. And sure enough, when they pulled the records of Lazarus, she was off on the day of the murder. Now, they tried to match the bullets found at the crime scene to the type of gun Lazarus had at the time because the bullets found in Sherry's body came from a 38 caliber revolver, which, by the way, Ferg, was a standard issue gun for all police officers back in L.A. at that time in 1986. And investigators found out that Lazarus had purchased a second 38 caliber Smith & Wesson after graduating from the police academy. When detectives started to trace the serial number of the second gun that she had purchased, they got a hit that it had been reported stolen to the Santa Monica Police Department in March of 1986. This is just a few weeks after the murder. What a coincidence, Ferg. What do you think happened to the gun? Well, if I had to guess, I would say it it might be at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. You think? I mean, why would she go and report that gun missing? What would be her reason to go and report that gun stolen weeks after this murder? Think about that. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear, Af, that she wants to create a trail in case that gun ever comes back to her. Well, even without the murder weapon, things were starting to fall into place because it was starting to look as though it was Stephanie Lazarus who murdered Sherry Rasmussen back in 1986. But investigators had a nagging thought at this point because the evidence that they had before them had been available to police in 1986. So why did police not look closer at Lazarus and at least try to eliminate her as a suspect? It's not just nagging to to investigators, it's nagging to me. Because here's the thing, there were reports that some of the evidence had possibly gone missing from the case file over the years. So was someone inside the police force trying to protect Lazarus or was she able to somehow slowly and systematically get rid of some of the pieces of evidence over that long stretch of those years? And this is one that I have a really hard time with, Af, because, so whichever one is the case, 
why not get rid of the most crucial pieces of evidence that could contain DNA? So then I go to the theory of, did none of that happen? Was it just sloppy handling of evidence by police and nothing more? Well, someone mishandled the evidence. And that's a question that's going to play a big part in the trial. But we'll get to that later. All I can say to answer your question is that, remember, there's no statute of limitations on murder. So that file had to be there. It couldn't be completely removed. If somebody tampered with it, we will never truly know. So in 2009, investigators put a tail on Lazarus and started to try to figure out how they were going to get a DNA sample from her so that they could compare it to the bite mark DNA. And one day as they were tailing her, they got their break because Lazarus was at a shopping area and investigators saw her throw away a cup and a straw. They wasted no time retrieving both items and sent them out for testing. And the DNA came back from that cup and the straw and Ferg, it was an exact match to the DNA that investigators recovered from that bite mark. The testing was so conclusive that get this, the odds that it belonged to anyone other than Stephanie Lazarus were one in 402 quadrillion. That's a big number, F. I know. I didn't even know that was a number. That's a number so big that it has like 20 zeros in it. So police know at this point that Stephanie Lazarus murdered Sherry Rasmussen because there's no other person on this earth who matched that DNA. But at the same time, they also know that Lazarus is one of their own and they have to figure out the best way to question her without rousing any suspicions. Now, incredibly, Lazarus works on the same floor in downtown LA in the Parker Center, just across the hall from the very detectives that were trying to put her away. On the morning of June 5th, 2009, Lazarus went to work as usual at the LAPD administration building in downtown LA. So one of the detectives working this case had concocted a ruse and asked Lazarus for her help. He said they had arrested someone who said they knew something about a big art theft and he asked Lazarus if she would go down to the basement with them to interrogate the suspect. And they did this because officers had to check their weapons before entering that area. And that was the thought not lost on these detectives because they're getting ready to point the finger at someone who knows how to shoot a gun. Now, at first, when they got her into the interrogation room, they played it so cool, Ferg, that Lazarus had no idea that she was about to be a suspect in a murder. But Lazarus was asked to sit in the seat normally reserved for suspects being interrogated. So you have to think she had to have been a little bit suspicious from the get-go. She even asked detectives when they planned to bring the suspect in. Well, at first detectives played along about bringing in the art thief, but soon they began to weave their tapestry. And they started to ask Lazarus questions about John Rutten. Did she know him? Oh, yes, she knew him. He was a good friend of hers in college. And did she know his wife? Did she ever meet his fiance? Now, Sherry, that name? Well, Lazarus couldn't really recall that at first. Let's listen to her talk to them in this police interview. Had you ever met his wife? I may have. Do you know, do you remember her name or anything or? Um. Um, or what she did for a living or where she worked or anything uh, about her? Well, I think she, I th I'm going to say that I think she was a nurse. Um, I think she worked at a hospital somewhere. And yeah, I may have met her at a hospital. Um, I may have talked to her once or twice. Um, Do you remember you know, the first name? <sighs> Shelly, um, Sherry, I don't know, something maybe, you know. Um, like I said, it's been so many years and... You mentioned a hospital, maybe. You may have talked to her at a hospital. Yeah, um, a number of times. I couldn't tell you how many times. Right. Because I know you, you went to talk to her at, at the hospital uh, regarding this issue with John. To, you know, kind of like, hey, you know, what's going to happen here with this thing? 
but would this ever have followed up to her house when you went to talk to her and just say, hey, you know what? I, I don't even know that I knew where they lived. Now, Af, how do you not remember your rival's name? Now, come on. I mean, I remember my high school rivals' names and my college. I don't. I don't just remember the names of my rivals from college and high school. I still can see their faces and worry about them coming around. Af, we have to take a quick break to talk about our sponsor, Casper. Casper understands the importance of sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering you're going to spend a third of your life on it. A Casper mattress is obsessively engineered at a shockingly fair price. The product is designed to ensure that you get just the right sink and just the right bounce. And Casper is extremely affordable because they sell directly to consumers. They have free shipping and free returns to the U.S. and Canada and a 100-night trial with free, no-hassle returns if you're not happy. Casper has over 20,000 reviews, averaging 4.8 stars, and it's quickly becoming the Internet's favorite mattress. And best of all, they're designed, developed, and assembled in the USA. Now, I've been sleeping on my Casper mattress for about a month now, and I can honestly say I'm getting the best sleep I've ever gotten. And right now, our listeners can get $50 off a mattress. All you have to do is go to casper.com, use the promo code Aphrodite. That's casper.com, promo code Aphrodite. So the detectives kept Lazarus talking for over an hour, which that's a huge amount of time. Lazarus could have stopped that at any time and asked for an attorney, but she didn't. Slowly moving toward the question of murder. Now they start to ask her, not only did she know who Sherry was, but whether or not she'd ever been inside her workplace or her home, and whether or not there was any kind of quarrel between them. And Lazarus is so calm and collected as she's talking to them. Listen to it. Did you ever fight with her? You mean like we fought? Yeah, did you ever yeah. duke it out with her? No, I don't think so. I mean... You'd remember that, right? That would be pretty... Yeah, I would think so. I pretty mean, specific. Th you know, yeah, like I said, I dramatic. mean, obviously... I, you know, I mean, it just doesn't sound familiar. It doesn't sound familiar to her? Either you had a fight or you didn't. I mean, what kind of weird answer is that for... Well, it's it's definitely weird, and I think it's at this point where she's starting to get nervous. Oh yeah, I watched the footage at trial and she starts to twitch a little bit. I mean, that moment is seared in my mind. As I'm watching her talking to police in that interrogation room, she keeps telling them she can't recall it. She's shocked. She's shocked that they're, they're accusing her of having any kind of argument and that anyone would be asking her questions like this. I mean, I mean, what are they saying? So I, I, I fought with her, so, so now, I mean, I, 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 I'm, Get, getting the jump of the leap excuse me i haven't eaten um they're saying okay i fought with her so i must have killed her i mean come on i mean that's you know i i don't even know who these people are i i can't even say i met any of these people i mean that's it's insane i, I if it happened i honestly don't remember it that's all i can tell you i mean during this interview detectives asked lazarus if she would be willing to give a dna swab and this is something that she's not willing to do. And what she does, she asks them at that point if she's free to leave. And they tell her she is. So Stephanie Lazarus calmly stands up. She thanks the detectives for giving her the opportunity to discuss this matter. But she only gets as far as the hallway because right there, she's arrested and handcuffed and detectives will bring her back into the interrogation room and start reading Lazarus her rights. This is absolutely crazy. Let's see, Stephanie. This is insane. Okay. Stephanie, you know you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand? Yes. Anything you say may be used against you in court. Do you understand? Yes. You have the right to the presence of an attorney before and during any question. Do you understand? Yes. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you free of charge before any questioning if you want. Do you understand? Yes. Do you want to talk to us right now? No. Okay. All right. Okay. This yeah. is crazy. Okay. This is absolutely... I'm like, I'm like in shock. I'm totally in shock. 
The arrest of Stephanie Lazarus shocked the city of LA. No one on the force could have foreseen this happening. You know, we talked about it, Af. Lazarus was known as a good cop, and not a single one of her co-workers would say that they ever saw any type of outward sign that this was possible. Yeah, I mean, Lazarus is the type of cop who was quick with a joke, who was the type to give coworkers a hug. I mean, never in anyone's wildest imagination did her coworkers think that she was capable of murder. But when it comes to Sherry's family, they were shocked by the arrest, not because of who they arrested, but because they never thought that more than 20 years after Sherry's murder, an arrest of an LAPD officer would be made. But for Sherry's family, the arrest didn't make their pain any less. If anything, at trial, they had to relive everything and they had to start the grieving process all over again. It was really tough for to watch Sherry's family. They were absolutely devastated. I was there at the trial of Stephanie Lazarus in 2012 in LA. And I can tell you, it was also extremely emotional for the other family, because remember both sides of the families of this felt they were victims. I mean, obviously Sherry's family were the actual victims, but Stephanie's family, her husband, her mother, brother, they were all feeling their own grief and shock. I mean, people don't really think about this, but I'm in courtrooms all the time. And I can tell you many members of a killer's family do become victims of their own beliefs. And actually in this case, Ferg, Stephanie's family was adamant. They were in such denial. They were certain that the case against Stephanie was rigged. And they believe the system was out to get her because she once worked in internal affairs and had helped put some crooked cops in jail. That was their theory, that this was the LAPD hanging Stephanie Lazarus out to dry. Deputy District Attorney Shannon Presby said that the case against Lazarus came down to, quote, a bite, a bullet, a gun barrel, and a broken heart. And keep in mind that the trial lasted five weeks. And during that time, More than 60 witnesses testified. The state presented over 400 exhibits. They had to convince the jury that they had an airtight case. Prosecutors knew that they had a hurdle to clear. Would the jury forget that Lazarus had been an exemplary cop for 25 years? The prosecution portrayed Stephanie Lazarus as a jealous woman who couldn't handle that John Rutten decided to marry another woman. And they produced her diary as evidence where there were entries that read things like this. I found out that John is getting married and I'm very depressed. And other things, a letter that Stephanie wrote to John's mom where she says, and I'm quoting, I have very strong feelings for John. I'm truly in love with him. And this past year has really torn me up. I don't think I'll ever understand John's decision. Now, those entries are proof that Stephanie Lazarus can't get over this breakup and the fact that John Rutten rejected her. She is the woman scorned. And John Rutten would be the star witness for the prosecution. And Rutten had not spoken publicly about his wife's murder since 1986. He told the jury about the meeting he had with Lazarus at her condo just before the wedding. And John would say she was extremely upset. She cried and begged me not to get married. The two had sex that day, but John still went through with the wedding just two weeks later. And while John was the star witness, there was another star witness in this case, and that was the DNA. And that's what I want to talk about, because when the bite mark analysis was done, the two major contributors to the saliva belonged to, guess who? Stephanie Lazarus and Sherry Rasmussen. After the trial, I actually interviewed Stephanie's brother, Stephen Lazarus, and he just couldn't accept that the DNA belonged to Stephanie. I mean, this guy was certain that the DNA evidence had been tampered with And he argued that the judge was prejudiced against his sister to the point that Stephen later told me he was certain he could prove his sister's innocence. He actually believed with all his heart 
that the LAPD had planted Stephanie's DNA into an old test tube from 1986. Can you believe that, Ferg? I don't know, Af. I'm not a scientist, but in my mind, I think that it's possible that someone could contaminate DNA. Well, I also spoke with Stephanie's mom, who insisted that not only was Stephanie the most caring and loving person in the world, but that the police had it out for her. There was no evidence. There were no fingerprints. There was no blood, no fibers. There was nothing to connect Stephanie to this murder other than the DNA, which she insisted had been contaminated. Well, the defense for Stephanie Lazarus, they also tried to show that the integrity of the DNA bite mark evidence was questionable. They argued that the file it was stored in was not properly sealed and the envelope that contained the sample was ripped. And they also attempted to show reasonable doubt by hammering home some very specific blood evidence in this case because it turns out there was blood on a rope that was at the crime scene that came from an unidentified male. And that blood was analyzed for DNA and it did not match either Lazarus or Rasmussen. Her defense attorney also pointed out, Ferg, that John Rutten had continued to pursue Lazarus even after becoming engaged to Sherry. So what they were doing is painting a picture to the jury that Stephanie Lazarus was not the obsessed lover that the prosecution was making her out to be, that it was John Rutten who was going after Stephanie. Well, we know that Lazarus and Rutten were intimate on at least one occasion after he became engaged to Rasmussen. But there's no way that we can ever really know the true extent of the relationship. Her diary entry shows that she had this deep obsessive love for John, but oddly enough, after Sherry was killed, Stephanie never pursued John again. Well, and to me, Af, that's telling. Stephanie knows that she can't go near John. You know, we're talking about a very cunning, smart person. You know, she's trying to be careful not to become a suspect. But still, she did love John. So, uh, you know, it, it, in, in my mind, this is a crime of passion. And we have to talk about the gruesome way in which the victim was killed in order to understand just how much rage was involved here. I mean, Ferg, prosecutors believe the bite mark occurred before Sherry was killed. So she was attacked, beaten in the face with some blunt object, possibly the butt of a gun or the ceramic vase that was shattered. But the fact was, Sherry's face was disfigured. And that's something very personal. That's hate there. Do you know what I'm saying, Ferg? No, it's up close, it's personal. Yeah, I agree with you. And there were three shots fired into Sherry's chest, rapidly fired shots. One went through her lungs, another through her spine, and she was shot through the heart. Now, any one of those shots could have killed her, but this person went one step further and shot Sherry Rasmussen through the heart. And just think how determined and calculated this killer was. You know, prosecutors tell the jury that the fatal encounter began upstairs in the apartment when the assailant fired two shots that missed Sherry and ended up shattering the sliding glass door. And this is what would cause the fragments of glass to rain down. And this is what John would see when he would come home that night. And Lazarus apparently chased Sherry downstairs and what police believe is the two women wrestled and fought ferociously because a lot of blood was found on the tile floor in the foyer. And that was the area that led to the garage and to the front door. A bloody handprint of the victim was found low to the ground on a wall. So prosecutors theorized that Sherry was trying to escape. At some point, they believe Sherry got the upper hand in the fight and that she may have been able to take control of Stephanie Lazarus. And that would explain why Sherry had a bite mark on the inside of her forearm, because Stephanie bit Sherry to get free from her grasp. 
by the time the prosecution was done, there was very little doubt that Stephanie Lazarus went to Sherry Rasmussen's apartment with the sole purpose of killing her. This was cold-blooded, premeditated murder, and Lazarus knew exactly how to set it up to make it look like a burglary gone wrong. She pulled a drawer out, dumped the contents, she stacked up the stereo equipment. I mean, Aff, this was all very well thought out. I know. I went to that garden apartment complex in Van Nuys, and I studied exactly how Stephanie plotted to kill her quote-unquote rival. For one thing, because there was no sign of forced entry in this case, I took a look at the door on apartment 205, and I saw how easy it could be for someone to pick that. And what do I find out later? Stephanie Lazarus was an expert with lock picking. And then when I walked around the perimeter of that apartment complex, in my mind, I could actually see Lazarus casing the joint because there was a six foot wall surrounding the complex. So it would be so easy for Lazarus to lay in wait and hide. And we know Stephanie was stalking Sherry, but now I realized as I'm standing there that she was pinpointing Sherry's every move. And who knows how long she was creeping around that apartment complex, Ferg, because she's walking around disguised as a man. And that was one of the big questions that I had, Af, in this case is how did Stephanie Lazarus know that Sherry Rasmussen would be home that day? Well, my theory is she was so busy on her day off watching that apartment that when she saw that Sherry didn't leave in her BMW as she normally would, and this murder happened within a particular hours in the morning. So she knew Sherry had changed up her routine that day. She didn't leave for work at the exact time she always did. You know, I wrote to Stephanie Lazarus in jail and requested that she agree to call me or sit down with me for some kind of an interview because she was so adamant through her brother that she was going to prove her innocence herself. But Stephanie never responded. And I wonder why. Now, Af, I think I would pay money to see that. That would have been a hell of an interview. Believe me, I was chomping at the bit to get to sit down with Stephanie Lazarus. And especially because she was so good at portraying her innocence. I got to tell you, watching her in court, she just sat there looking virtually stunned that any of this trial was going on. She clearly had the look on her face like she's sitting in an orange jumpsuit and she doesn't know what the hell's going on. Like, this isn't real for her. This, like, this can't be happening. And her family believed her. But the jury didn't because it took the eight women, four men jury, just a day of deliberation to find Stephanie Lazarus guilty of the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. But you know, for to this day, Lazarus maintains her innocence and somehow believes she's going to prove to the world that she's been framed. On May 11, 2012, Stephanie Lazarus was sentenced to 27 years to life in prison with the possibility of parole for the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. Prosecutors said in court, quote, Lazarus misused her police training and experience to commit murder and to cover up the crime. She betrayed the trust placed in her by the Los Angeles Police Department and by the people of Los Angeles. Lazarus betrayed this trust to pursue her own murderous ends. And how true is that? I mean, think about a woman who served on the police force for over two decades and was actually helping to put crooked cops behind bars. And all the while she had murdered this rival and covered up the crime and gone on with her happy-go-lucky life. I don't even have words to describe what a turncoat this is to the men and women in blue. Yeah, Af, I think Stephanie Lazarus, she sullied the image of her fellow officers and the Rasmussen family would sue both Stephanie Lazarus and the LAPD. 
and the LAPD would conduct their own investigation into the handling of the evidence, and they concluded that there was no evidence of any type of cover-up. But here's my final thought, Ferg. I don't believe there was a cover-up. I don't believe Stephanie Lazarus was framed. But the fact that Sherry Rasmussen was killed just because she fell in love with someone and married him, that haunts me. The notion that this murder was somehow connected to jilted love, well, that just goes to prove that the line between love and murder can sometimes be very thin. If you like the show, take a minute, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Rate and review the show, and you can do that on iTunes or your favorite Android app. You can follow us on Facebook by searching for Sex, Love, and Murder or on Twitter at SLM Podcast. So everybody out there, we really do want to hear from you and we will respond, we promise. Mike, give them the information as how they contact us. You can email us at sexloveandmurder at gmail.com. Okay, everybody, did you hear that? We want to hear from you. I'm Aphrodite Jones. And I'm Mike Ferguson. And you're listening to Sex, Love, and Murder, the place where love and insanity are more connected than people think.